Now that Jurassic World Dominion is releasing in theaters all over the world, the reviews are coming in and a lot of them are very negative. A lot of fans are disappointed and angry. And I think I know why. They pronounce it Giganotosaurus. You know what you clicked on. This is a spoiler-filled discussion of Jurassic World Dominion. I'll be going through the entire plot, roasting and praising it in as many detail as possible. This is your final warning. You can check out my spoiler-free review on the channel if you want to stay away from spoilers. It's fun times, you see my face, good luck with that. Obviously, the intro is a joke. They do really pronounce it Giganotosaurus. And I'm more of a Giganotosaurus kind of gal, but there is a lot more about Jurassic World Dominion that's not quite right. But there's also a lot of stuff in there that I did enjoy, and in this video I'll be talking about both. I think it's kind of unfair to praise it blindly, and I think it's unfair to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The movie opens with a short Mosasaur scene making an epic appearance in the season finale of Deadliest Catch, flipping the crab fishing boat on its side. I hope you enjoyed this scene, Mosasaurus fans, because aside from a little clip in the ending montage, it does not return. We cut to an in-universe news report which explains what happened after the ending of Fallen Kingdom. All that took place four years ago, and since then the dinosaurs have spread throughout the world, and there is a thriving black market for dinosaurs. The dinosaurs are posing a real threat to our society. People are dying. I don't remember where I heard or read this storytelling tip, but it was along the lines of, if you have to use a news report for exposition, you did something wrong. But the biggest mistake is not really how Dominion unloads its opening exposition onto us, but what the exposition is about. I'll come back to that later in this walkthrough of the plot. The first familiar characters we see are Claire, Zia and Franklin, who have basically gone rogue trying to take down the illegal trade in dinosaurs. In the scene we see them break into an illegal breeding facility for an Pseudoceratops and Cyanoceratops. Once the juveniles is sick and won't make it until the DFW does a formal investigation and intervention, Fiends, so Claire decides to rescue the one juvenile. They are found out during their escape, so there's a bit of a chase with Claire behind the wheel racing this van through the paddock with big angry ceratopsians while being chased by the bad guys firing shots at them. Luckily, the Nasudos and Sinos flip the chasing trucks and Claire, Zia and Franklin escape. This is one of many awesome dinosaur scenes in the movie that I just wish lasted longer. The movie chose quantity over quality when it comes to the dinosaurs, and while as a dinosaur fan I obviously love seeing so many different species appear, many of the scenes did leave me wanting more, like give it a little bit more time to be truly epic. Z and Franklin break the news to Claire at dawn that they can't keep doing this, and Franklin mentions having a new job that he's more suitable for, and that being shot at is more of an Owen kind of thing. He implies that Claire still has a strange relationship with Owen after two movies, and I really thought, oh no, oh hell no, they are not going to recycle the get-together arc again, right? But thankfully they don't. The relationship between Owen and Claire is actually very cute and also kind of normal, so I don't understand this this hint at all. It was very strange. Speaking of Owen, we cut to him wrangling Parasaurolophus as an actual cowboy. We've seen this in the trailer, it's pretty campy. Uh, the scene gets even weirder when he singles out one Parasaurolophus and manages to stop the rampaging dinosaur holding onto the rope with just his hands and using a tree stump to stop its momentum. I'm pretty sure that if we were to respect physics, um, which I rarely do, of course, I mean, F physics, am I right? <laughs> but I'm pretty sure he would have either flung back around that tree stump and just dragged behind that Parasaurolophus for the next couple of miles, or the rope would have simply slipped from his hand. It was a little cringe, but okay, I'm, I've accepted that this is part of Owen's contribution to the Jurassic franchise. He is an action hero. He's not a protagonist, he is an action hero. So the para is stopped and he calms it down and he leads it somewhere safe, as he says. Somewhere safe is a DFW rest stop and then to Biosyn. As explained in the news report opening, Biosyn has global collection rights for all the dinosaurs. All dogs go to heaven, all dinosaurs go to Biosyn. Without Owen realizing, he has a stalker though, a dude with a face tattoo, just so you know he's evil. It's either being bald or a face tattoo, that is a dead giveaway in movies. 
This guy is a poacher and he is after Maisie and Blue's baby. Maisie is living with Claire and Owen in the cabin he built, basically in the middle of nowhere. Being a teenager, she's not a fan of that. I mean, I personally wouldn't be a fan of it as an adult either, but anyway. As a teenager, she acts up quite a lot about it, going into town when she's not supposed to, because as is again said in the new support opening, pretty much everyone is looking for her. Bad guys, legal people, everyone. Since Fallen Kingdom didn't exactly leave me feeling affectionate towards the character of Maisie, seeing her be a moody teen didn't make her more appealing to me, and it was in fact very grating upon first viewing. But her character gets better later on in the film, meaning that the second and the third time I watched it, I had actually warmed up to her, and I found myself being a lot more forgiving. That being said, the movie delves way more into her backstory than I needed or wanted it to, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Living in the area is Blue with her baby, Beta. The two only have a brief encounter with Maisie and Owen at the cabin. I think it would have been better if the movie had spent a bit more time familiarizing Beta with Maisie and Owen. The way it plays out currently is Oh, hey, Blue had a baby. Welp, she's been kidnapped. Gotta go rescue her. Because Mr. Face Tattoo comes in and kidnaps both Beta and Maisie. This sets the Claire and Owen storyline in action as they go on a rescue mission. Franklin, who now works for the CIA's department dedicated to tracking down dinosaurs and capturing them, gets contacted by Claire and she and Owen guilt him into breaking confidentiality, risking his job essentially. <laughs> the CIA is, I don't think, very forgiving about that sort of stuff. But anyway, <laughs> he reveals that Face Tad Man is Rain Delacorte and he is making a sale in the black market in Malta tomorrow. Barry from the first Jurassic World film has been recruited by French intelligence and is undercover to intercept and shut the operation down. The Malta scene is very long, but ultimately a bit meaningless. Maisie and Beta are only there as a layover as they get handed off to Biosyn, because of course Biosyn is the villain. So the point of Claire and Owen going all the way over there um, is lost to me because, yeah, with the way the story is constructed, Maisie and Beta are only there for like the blink of an eye and then they're gone. So it's, it's a really big misdirect. Now I do recognize that Malta is the scene where they introduce Kayla as a new character, but they could have slotted her introduction in somewhere else. And the same for the Atrocity Raptors. And I actually have an idea of where I would have preferred for them to be used. We'll get that when we get to that. The whole thing in Malta is a pretty fun scene, so I'm not too mad about it being a bit pointless, or at the very least guilty of being very inefficient narratively. It is, however, shot like a scene in a sequel from the Bourne franchise, which means a lot of shaky cam and quick cuts, which make the action very, very messy and does more harm than good. Malta is also the completely insignificant and random appearance of a Bond villain type of character, Soyona Santos. She hands Maisie and Beta off to Biosyn and then appears at the black market to tell Rain Delacorte, Mr. Face Tat, that she wants him to transport these super dangerous atroci raptors. Everything about her, from the way she dresses, to her dialogue, to her facial expressions, it's, it's not even a Bond villain, it's like a parody of a Bond villain. She's about as subtle as Dr. Evil. This is when Owen, Barry, and Claire interfere Rain Delacorte tries to escape through the black market but gets a triple threat death of Juvie Carno, Lystrosaurus and Baryonyx. The Atrocity Raptors get set free from their cages, which I will say was an awesome reveal. That first time we see them, they look great, strong, threatening. There's something intimidating just about how they move. I thought it was really good, but like for a brief second, because at that point, the Bond villain reveals that not only are the Atroci Raptors trained, they are trained the way the Indoraptor was. They are laser guided killing machines. Yes. They brought that back from Fallen Kingdom. It's it's so dumb. It's so dumb watching her aim this laser pointer at each of the French intelligence agents one by one to set the Atrocity Raptors on their asses. If she had a gun, she could have just shot all of the agents then and there and it would have been done. But no. Someone in the writing room is still convinced that large, unreliable predators that need to be moved around in a truck, by the way, are the most efficient way for one human to kill another human. Anyway, 
There's an action scene, the Atrociraptors get sent after Owen, and we get the motorcycle chase that we've seen in the trailers. The reason the Atrociraptors don't kill him 27 times over is because they are uncoordinated dipshits. They are constantly slipping, stumbling, and crashing into things. Also, for some reason, even when they run alongside him, keeping pace with him, they don't go for the easy kill. It's like a police chase, where the police cars have to first get in front to bring everything to a stop. For the same reason, that reason being that the Atrociraptors are uncoordinated dipshits, that's a technical term, don't worry about it. Claire also manages to escape the Atrociraptor that is after her, with the help of cool girl Kayla. Kayla is way too much of a tough chick caricature in like the first five minutes we see of her. It gets better after that, thankfully, and I ended up quite liking her. Honestly, a lot across the board gets better later in the film. Character, dialogue, pacing, action, dinosaurs, even editing gets better as the movie finds its stride. The first, I want to say the first third, maybe even first half of the movie is just really clanky, overstuffed and overambitious, meaning it overstretches itself. Kayla's helping Claire because Kayla actually illegally flies dinosaurs all over the world, including to and from Biosyn. And she saw Maisie get handed off to Biosyn, knowing damn well that that ain't good. So when Claire shows up looking for her daughter, Kayla decides to help. Owen catches up with Kayla and Claire just as the plane takes off, and like that, they are on their way to Biosyn. Meanwhile, in a galaxy far, far away, that being Texas and Utah, we get the return of Ellie Sadler and Alan Grant. Ellie Sadler gets called to a farm to investigate the effects of a swarm of absolutely massive locusts, which have been decimating crops, but not Biosyn crops. <laughs> Ellie is a smart cookie, but it doesn't take a genius to figure this one out. She goes over to Alan's paleontological dig site in Utah to convince him to come with her to the Biosyn headquarters in Italy. Of all people, Ian Malcolm works there as an in-house philosopher, and he invited her over. It is the perfect ruse for her to get in the door and get samples of locusts she expects Biosyn is bioengineering there. She can then compare the DNA of that locust with the one that was caught in Texas, proving Biosyn's villainous plan. And it truly is villainous. Dominion raises the stakes beyond any Jurassic film before it. Whereas before only the lives of the people present were in the balance, the threat that looms over Dominion is the absolute total catastrophic collapse of the global food chain, which would result in millions of people dying of starvation. Yes, starvation, not of dinosaurs, starvation. I referenced several times in my spoiler-free review and in my ranking video that Dominion is too ambitious, and this is one of the things I mean. It's no longer enough for a couple of lives to be in danger. This is a world where in every superhero spin-off, the world must be saved, and Dominion tries to be like the cool kids but ultimately it fails by overreaching and making a massive misstep. Because the dinosaurs are not the real danger of the movie. These locusts are. We were made to believe for the past few years that dinosaurs would dominate, but it's bugs, basically. So even though the very intro of the movie, the news report, sets up the premise of dinosaurs being a global issue, this is not actually the issue that the movie deals with. It completely shifts its focus to this threat to the world food chain, and the dinosaurs are, crudely put, window dressing. They are obstacles in many scenes, very entertaining obstacles, but just obstacles. If you take dinosaurs out of Dominion, the movie essentially won't change. The movie would be shorter, for sure, because there would be fewer challenges, but none of the other Jurassic films work like that. Jurassic Park 1, dinosaurs escape in a theme park. Jurassic Park 2, dinosaurs get captured and taken to the mainland. Jurassic Park 3, Kit gets stranded on Dinosaur Island and must be rescued. Jurassic World, dinosaurs escape in a theme park. Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, dinosaurs get captured and taken to the mainland. You saw that one coming, didn't you? Jurassic World Dominion, locusts threaten the global food supply and must be stopped. That is the essence of the plot. Dominion tries something new, but it gets so focused on that that it forgets what it should be about. Dinosaurs. Don't get me wrong, the film is chock full of dinosaurs. Great appearances too, and possibly more dinosaurs than we've ever seen before. 
but they are not necessary to the narrative. And that is an interesting writing mistake. Anyway, of course, Alan agrees to come with Ellie because it's telegraphed very clearly that he is still in love with her. He has an old picture of them together and it reads in just his entire demeanor. By the way, pay attention to the miniature Spinosaurus skeleton in the background during the scene because it is the only Spinosaurus you will see. In a movie that pretty much ticks all of the fan service boxes, not including the Spino was an odd oversight. It was like the writers haven't updated their understanding of the public perception of the Spinosaurus since like 2005 or whatever. Because the Spino went from being hated for killing a Rex in 2001 to being a definite fan favorite. And they missed out on not giving us a cameo at least, instead of that long Malta scene, for example. So now all our characters are heading towards the Biosyn compound in the Biosyn Valley. This is well ahead of the midway point of the movie, and it's a little sad, honestly. The movie promised us dinosaurs in our world, but the majority of the runtime we once more spent in a remote location where the dinosaurs are isolated from the public. The Malta scene and some montage-like shots are the most we see of dinosaurs in our world. I was expecting and hoping for them to deliver more on that premise of dinosaurs really being in our world. And I was kind of hoping that the whole movie would just take place in a city. When Owen, Claire and Kayla reach the Biosyn Valley, the system that keeps the flying reptiles from attacking aircrafts is shut down by the order of Lewis Dodgson, CEO of Biosyn. So our hero's airplane gets attacked by a Quetzalcoatlus. It swoops in, wrecks the plane, and then just gets the heck out of there and it just leaves the movie to never be seen again. You've basically seen it all in the trailer. As the plane goes down, Owen has a touching scene with Claire where he encourages her to use the ejection seat so she can survive and go save Maisie, with her being her mom after all. He assures her that he'll be fine, but neither he nor Kayla have a parachute and no real prospect of surviving the crash. But Claire has to save Maisie. So she ejects and the camera is on her face as she shoots out of the plane. It's really well done and is one of many scenes where Bryce Dallas Howard shines as an actress. The parachute deploys, but she gets attacked by Pteranodon that ripped the parachute. Thankfully, she has a second emergency parachute and she ends up landing safely. Well, sort of landing, sort of safely. She's dangling from a tree and as she is trying to undo the safety harness, we get one of my favorite scenes in the movie. The Therizinosaurus steps into frame and what makes the scene even more creepy than the setting, the cinematography, and the fact that the theory is just absolutely terrifying to begin with, is that it's blind and it's using echolocation to get around. The sounds it makes to do this were really spooky and it absolutely yeets a deer, which was really funny to me. Claire escapes the theory by going into some swampy water and the scene ends with her looking into the distance and seeing the smoke of the plane crash. And yes, this is indeed the heartbreaking point of the movie where Chris Pratt's character dies and Morbius comes in to take over the lead. Owen and Kayla survived, of course they did, but as soon as they're out of the plane, they face the next threat, a Pyroraptor. And the Pyroraptor does something very interesting, and by interesting I mean stupid. So instead of just charging Kayla and Owen, the Pyroraptor jumps into the water and swims under the ice under their feet. Not really doing anything, just sort of waiting. But Kayla and Owen haul ass out of there, and when they jump over another crack, Owen breaks through the ice and ends up in the water. And that's when the Pyroraptor swims towards him, circles around him, and it goes to attack him, but Kayla pulls him out of the water just in time. And I know, I know I'm gonna get comments like, well, actually, Pyroraptor was theorized to have been able to swim. Because I get those comments every single time I mention this scene. But everyone is just blatantly ignoring the difference between having been able to swim slash having been able to swim well and diving the way it does. The Pyroraptor, an animal kind of built like an ostrich, is shown to swim with the speed and agility of a swordfish. It just doesn't work. It doesn't look right. It's not built for that. It's built different. The Pyroraptor jumps back out of the water again and does what it should have done in the first place, chase after Owen and Kayla. Logically, they should have both died at this point because they have to climb a ladder to get away from it, and that takes a while. And to justify them not getting ripped to pieces right here is that 
Well, the Pyroraptor got wet from its little swim, so it has to shake itself dry. And it takes so long to do that, that Kayla and Owen climb the ladder and have a head start down a walkway towards an elevator, and they close the door on the Pyroraptor before it gets to them. So the Pyroraptor swimming is also just a stupid move in universe as well. Owen and Kayla go to find Claire, whose ejection seat has a homing beacon. They find the chair, they find the dead deer, but not Claire. Who also finds the dead deer is Rexy. She was seen getting flown into the Biosyn Valley earlier in the movie, and now we have her up and about. But before she gets her snack, the Giganotosaurus appears. The setting of this scene is really beautiful, and they have a short fight over the deer that I really wish would have lasted longer, because it looks a lot better than the finale fight in my opinion. Meanwhile, Kayla is basically narrating to Owen, This is the Giganotosaurus, largest terrestrial predator ever. You put two apexes in the same valley, soon there will be only one. Of course, this foreshadows a rematch between the Rex and the Giga. For now, the Rex walks off, letting the Giga eat the deer. Night has settled, and Claire has found her way to one of those viewing towers. But while she waits for a ladder to automatically come down so she can climb to safely, we hear a very familiar and very unsettling hooting call. It is the long-awaited return of the Dilophosaurus. The setup here is really well done. That call is absolutely iconic, and it's instantly terrifying, even though it sounds kind of cute, but we all know what's going to happen. And instead of one, we have multiple Dilos honing in on her. Unfortunately, it must be said that the animatronic from 1993 was much, much better than what we get in Dominion. Props to them for using animatronics, it was definitely the right choice, but they just aren't as good. Of course, not all animatronics are created equal since the passing of Stan Winston. Claire comes face to face with one of the Dilophosaurus, and right before it is about to spit its venom, Owen grabs it by the throat and you see the venom oozing out of the Dilo's mouth, which was kind of horrifying. Owen then sort of just shoes it away with this very American, go get! <laughs> <laughs> and I found that really dumb, <laughs> but okay. At least we had the return of the Dilo, and I was pleasantly surprised that they have an even better appearance later in the film. So at this point, Owen, Claire, and Kayla are reunited, and this is also the point in the story where they meet the other half of the cast. But first, I should get into how they got out there. So, rewind. Mesa and Beta have been taken from Malta to Biosyn and are dropped off at Dr. Wu's lab. Dr. Wu needs to study her and Beta's DNA to figure out how to solve the locust problem, which is a problem of his own creation. Dr. Wu created the locusts, as instructed by his boss, Lewis Dodgson. But the locusts are much more of a pest and a threat than anticipated, and Wu wants to make it right, even though Dodgson is like, nah, whatever. In the scene between Maisie and Wu, he explains to her that it wasn't her grandfather who cloned her, but her own mother or original. So we have a bit of retconning going on here, pretending that dear old Papa Lock would try to protect his daughter Charlotte's reputation. Charlotte used her science powers to get herself pregnant with her own clone, Maisie, and Blue and Beta are an obvious parallel to that. The exposition includes Dr. Wu gushing over how brilliant of a scientist Charlotte was, much better than he could ever hope to be. And at that point, I was like, okay, um, this, this is not the same character from the past movies. And I don't mind characters changing. A change is development, and character development is exactly what you do want. But Dr. Wu's development all happens between Fallen Kingdom and Dominion. He was a scientist doing whatever the frick he wanted out of his own sense of grandiosity in Fallen Kingdom. Then, in the interlude between movies, he makes the locusts, realizing millions of people will starve, and he becomes a good guy hell-bent on correcting that mistake. And that is how we get introduced to him in Dominion. If your character has developments, but you choose not to use it and instead be like, oh yeah, he's different now, you've wasted a ton of potential. Not a fan of that. Anyway, Maisie is like, F this shit, I'm out. While she's left unattended, as Dodgson is berating Wu for telling her about Charlotte to begin with, Maisie releases Beta and escapes herself. Alan and Ellie have also arrived at the compound. Upon their arrival, Dodgson fawns over them for a bit before handing them off to his right-hand man, Ramsey Cole. Dodgson is very weird. 
I'm gonna save my thoughts on him until later. Ramsey shows Ellie and Alan around and takes them to see Ian Malcolm, who gives lectures to Biosyn employees about the importance and dangers of what they are doing there with genetic research. His speech is pretty cringe to me. It's it's like the worst of pseudo intellectual mumbo jumbo. <laughs> <laughs> but like the audience is absolutely riveted and is basically drooling over him. We see several shots of the audience members just staring at him intensely like he's revealing the secret of life to them. And it's really dumb. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little rivalry between Alan and Ian, continuing from what is hinted at in the first movie and what we see more of in JP3, and it's very amusing to me personally. Alan is like this fish-out-of-water, out-of-touch dad type, which is kind of daring. Ian is the most Ian he has ever been. Uh, like I said, his speech, which introduced him, made me cringe, but I was relieved to learn later on that his whole role at Biosyn is just a ruse. Ian has basically infiltrated Biosyn, and he invited Ellie over to expose the company's evil ways. So he gives her his access wristband and goes his own way, and Ellie and Alan go into the restricted labs to find the Locus. And we have the second extended scene featuring the Locus at that point. And when they swarm, they bite and they scratch at people, so they are a threat, but they are a scene stealer, and not in the positive way. What I mean is, they steal scenes that could have been used to show more of what we all paid money to see. The dinosaurs. I'm pretty sure the locusts have more combined screen time than any other creature in the movie, because we see even more of them later on. Maybe if you really were to whip out the stopwatch, the Giga edges them out, but they are in this movie a lot. Think about that, at the very least, they are the second most featured creature in the finale installment of our beloved dinosaur franchise. It's, um, it's an interesting choice. Alan and Ellie get the samples and escape the lab full of huge swarming locusts, and they have this little, ooh, will they kiss moment? But Maisie comes in as an absolute cock block and is like, oh my god, you're Alan Grant and Ellie Sadler. And they're like, yup. And then they're all like, we should get the F out of here. So they go to the Hyperloop station where they were told to be and Ramsey catches up to them and this is where it is revealed that Ramsey is actually the mastermind behind this whistleblower operation, not Malcolm. Ramsey told Ian about the Locusts and set this whole thing in motion. But calling him a mastermind is maybe a bit too generous. I really like this character, I really do. He's well acted, he's interesting, he gets a cool little silent FU moment with Dodgson. But he's not very smart. I don't see why he set up this convoluted plan where he involved multiple other people to leak information that he could have leaked himself. He is Dodgson's right-hand man. Dodgson trusts him blindly, like right up until Ramsey outs himself as a mole. He has access to everything, not just the locusts themselves, but all the files needed to expose the company. But instead of exposing Biosyn himself, he has Ian involve Ellie to come in to physically steal evidence, putting her life at risk with no guarantee that she's going to make it out of the compound with said evidence. If there is a logical reason for this inefficient plan, the movie never gives it, so I don't, I don't think there was. But anyway, Ramsey sends them, them being Alan, Ellie, and Maisie, on their way in the Hyperloop back to the airport. But at, like, the control room of the facility, Dodgson is informed by his head of security or whatever that, after the fact, they notice camera footage of Alan and Ellie going into the Locust lab and Ian giving them his security access wristband before them. So Dodgson calls Ian up to the control room just to fire him and to show him that he is shutting down the Hyperloop pod that Ellie, Alan, and Maisie are in, stranding them in the Dimetrodon-infested amber mines. Dodgson has this comical moment of, oh, oopsie, people in the mines? Oh, golly gee, what a day, am I right? And it is funny, but it doesn't help to make him an intimidating villain. He's the most villainous villain there has ever been in the entire franchise. If he had his way, millions of people would have died as a direct result of his call, and he couldn't care less. But he's odd, he's constantly snacking, which has been pointed out to me as a reference to his greed and disregard for the hunger he will be causing, which is a neat little detail, but still undermines his character, because nobody is intimidating, constantly snacking on peanuts. Also when his head of security is like, uh, are you sure you want to condemn these people to death? Dodgson makes this weird, 
uh, uh, sound. And later, when the shit hits the fan and his entire valley is literally on fire, he has this comical breakdown where he flails his arms and kicks a chair. He just doesn't live up to being an actually ruthless villain. Anyway, Ian is fired and Ramsay of all people is asked by Dodgson to show Ian out of the building. Of course, what Ramsay actually does is give Ian a jeep and tell him where the amber mines are so Ian can go save the others. Meanwhile, Alan, Ellie and Maisie are making their way through the amber mines unaware of the danger there. There's another interaction that hints at Alan being completely smitten with Ellie and Ellie also being open to it. But you know, they're in a life-threatening situation and babysitting a kid. So maybe keep it in your pants. As a viewer, we get a nice sneak peek at the Dimetrodon with a little reference to the Spinosaurus. In JP3, we see the Spinos sail above the water before it attacks the boat. In the mines, we see the Dimetrodon sail above the water. The whole sequence with the Dimetrodon is very well done in my opinion. It builds the tension, we get a jump scare that actually did make me jump out of my seat on first viewing. And the setting is perfect for a horror kind of cinematography. But they find their way to the exit and with the help of Ian and Ramsey remotely, they escape the mines and are on their way. Dodgson, in the meantime, is deleting the evidence of the Locust project and then trying to destroy the Locust themselves. Unfortunately for him, through some Death Star-esque weakness in the facility, the Locusts escape while they are literally on fire. As they fly off, and they are on fire as they're flying off, some fall dead to the ground, burnt to a crisp. They set the force on fire and they hail on the jeep Ian, Alan, Ellie and Maisie are in, causing them to crash. And through coincidence only seen in movies, their jeep crashes right where Owen, Claire and Kayla are. So this is where the entire main cast unites for the very first time. And I have to say, I like how this was done. Not the coincidence part, but saving it until this moment in the movie. I think both casts separately were given quite a bit of time to do their own thing and impact the plot, the old cast more so than the new cast, and it's fitting that they aren't united as one until it is time for the big finale. Maisie has this cute reunion where she refers to Owen and Claire as her parents, even though earlier in the movie she said Claire wasn't her mother, which clearly hurt Claire. And this is where I thought back to the first Jurassic World movie where Claire literally forgot her nephews were on the island. She's come a long way and although this character development wasn't handled very elegantly with large chunks of it happening between movies, kind of like Wu, overall she has an interesting actual character arc, which is more than can be said for a lot of characters in this franchise. Also, I can't stress enough how much I like her and Bryce Dallas Howard as her in this movie. It really worked for me. But just as they find each other, the Giga also finds them. And this is where we also get Grant, our resident paleontologist, refer to the Giga as the biggest predator the world has ever seen. First of all, that's not really true, but the Jurassic franchise plays kind of fast and loose with science, so okay, I forgive you. What is really strange is that we got this exposition from him at all, because it's literally the same thing Kayla said earlier. Why is this said twice? It's so superfluous. It is a textbook example of unnecessary. The Giga approaches them really slowly and circles around them, and for this scene they use an animatronic for a lot of it, and I think it works fairly well. I think it's better than if the scene had been full CGI. But again, the animatronic just isn't as well done as they are in the original trilogy, the first two films in particular. There's just not as much lifelike movement to it. The characters try to escape up into the tower and the Giga bites down on the ladder while Maisie is on it. And she is screaming to Kayla, who is at the top of the ladder, that she doesn't want to die. And the acting here is really superb. She is realistically frozen in fear and she's really selling it. Isabella Sermon, just like Bryce Dallas Howard, does really well in this film. The Giga takes a moment to spit out some metal, giving Maisie time to climb up, and the others start to as well. To give everyone time to escape, Malcolm, who had been hiding in the overturned Jeep, mirroring Tim in the Upside Down Explorer in the first film. There are so many references in this, I honestly don't remember them all. There are many. But anyway, Malcolm spears a flaming locust on a stick and waves it around to distract the Giga so the others can climb up into the tower. We saw this in the trailer and I thought, how the hell is he supposed to survive this? Like, I knew he would, but how the hell is he supposed to survive this? 
Well, when the Giga faces him and roars, he throws the stick with the flaming locust like a javelin straight into the Giga's throat. And for a brief moment, the Giga becomes a literal fire-breathing dragon. This gives everyone a chance to climb the tower, but of course they aren't safe yet. The Giga comes in again, it tears at the walkway, nearly eating Illy, and it breaks through the glass, nearly getting Owen and Claire. But they fend him off, and the Giga decides, you know what? Not worth the trouble. I'm I'm a, I'm a head out. As the valley goes up in flames, Doshin gives the order to activate the brain implants that all dinosaurs have, which was referenced earlier. These implants send a signal that makes all dinosaurs come into the courtyard of the compound as a safety precaution. They'll drop whatever they're doing and get herded into the compound. Two things I don't like about this. One, it makes me think of the remote control dinosaurs from Camp Cretaceous, which is not something I enjoy seeing in the Jurassic franchise. But two, and in this context, most importantly, the courtyard of the compound isn't really that big. But the movie implies that all dinosaurs from the entire valley pile into that courtyard. We see a lot of dinosaurs head over, and remember, Biosyn has the sole global collection rights. All dinosaurs that are captured go to this valley. That courtyard should be packed, like they should be piled on top of each other. But we see at the end that it isn't. We actually see very few dinosaurs in the courtyard, even though it is mentioned also in dialogue that the dinosaurs are no longer in the valley, all of them are in that courtyard. Someone didn't think hard enough about this. Also going back to the compound are our heroes, because that's where there's a helicopter to escape in, and also they have to still save Beta. So they go to the compound, they reactivate the aerial deterrent system that keeps the flying reptiles in check to make the airspace safe for the helicopter, and Owen, Grant, and Maisie go fetch Beta in a scene that's supposed to be cool, but I thought was very cringy. Also, Alan gets this little bit of dialogue in this scene where he talks about... Um, you know, we used to think that velociraptors disemboweled their prey, but now we actually know that they were smart enough to go for the throat, to go for the instant kill. And this is presented as if it is more scary than being disemboweled, which is the exact opposite of what he did in the very first movie, and what he did way more convincingly. Being disemboweled and eaten alive is way more scary than a quick death by an efficient predator. And also we see in the first movie, through the death of Muldoon, that the Velociraptors don't go for the efficient kill. They do eat you while you're alive. So this dialogue was kind of frustrating to me. However, this whole thing does include two really funny lines from Ian, who challenges Owen's sanity for one, making a promise to a dinosaur to save her baby, and two, pointing out how odd it is that he's carrying a dinosaur around like a backpack. This is where we get another scene with the locusts, and I was very much done with the locusts at that point. I think what they could have done was lift the Malta scene out of the movie entirely and use the atrocity raptors here as a threat instead of the locusts. Like half Dodgson release the atrocity raptors into the compound to thwart anything that our heroes might try to do. Dr. Wu comes up to the group and is like, can I please come with you and save the world? And they're like, yeah, okay. So the entire group goes out into the courtyard where Kayla has landed the helicopter amidst the, I don't know, six dinosaurs that we see there, you know, all the dinosaurs in the valley, we see six. <laughs> but as the group runs for the helicopter, who makes her return? Rexy, of course. She recreates the logo in the fountain and approaches the group, but she's not actually interested in them because approaching them from the other side is the Giga. What follows is a fairly decent battle between the two huge predators, but it's really hampered by how much the camera focuses on the characters throughout the fight as they run around trying to avoid getting caught in the crossfire. This puts the camera really low, and most of the time the characters are the center of the frame, with the fight sort of as background noise. Cinematically, it's very underwhelming and just sells the action short. Speaking of short, the battle is also short. It is apparent all the way through that Rexy doesn't stand a chance, and it soon ends with Rexy on the ground, presumed dead, and the Giga standing on top of her. This is where Kayla fires a flare and it draws the attention of the Giga and the cameraman to another corner of the boxing ring where we see the Therizinosaurus. Yes, the Lego set spoiled the ending of another Jurassic movie. The Therizinosaurus, being territorial, takes on the Giga. 
I noticed that in this fight, there's no real sign of it being blind. Now, the Giga is huge and obviously noisy, so logically the theory could hear it moving around and know where it is, but it avoids getting bitten a couple of times in a way that isn't too realistic for it being a blind creature. And I also don't think it's making any of its echolocation sounds in that scene. While the theory and the Giga fight, Rexy comes to and gets back up. And she and the Theory team up against the Giga, and when they do, the Giga meets a swift end, basically getting knocked over by Rexy and then impaled on the Theory's giant claws. The end. Well, not quite. The characters fly to safety, and there's a little scene of Alan and Ellie going to testify, and Owen, Claire, and Maisie bring Beta back to blue. And Dr. Wu releases a single modified locust into the swarm, which apparently corrects everything about the threat to the global food chain that was about to happen. Blue was only in the movie for the very start and the very end. I didn't mind this, I'm not a huge fan of Blue as a character, and I'll never forgive her and Jurassic World as a whole for being the end of Scary Velociraptors, which is one of my favorite parts of all three movies in the original trilogy. But upon second viewing, I did realize they could have made the scene she had at the start a bit cooler by having her kill a couple of the poachers before they get away with Beta. It's also kind of strange that Maisie can just go with Owen and Claire, no questions asked, when Franklin said earlier in the movie that they couldn't just take her and that it was wrong in the eyes of the law. And it's also stated that everyone, not just bad guys, are trying to find her. But that just resolves itself? It's a non-issue by the end. The real ending of the movie is more of that news reporter from the start doing voiceover over some truly beautiful shots of the dinosaurs living their best life among modern wildlife. My favorite two being Rexy being with the Sornorex pair in the Biosyn Valley, and the Moza swimming with whales. Even though the single Moza being loose in the oceans, being as large as she is, is probably enough to tip the scales towards the extinction of many whale species. But okay, let's ignore that. The voiceover is like, we just gotta live together. Problem solved? The movie literally ends how it starts, with dinosaurs in our world and no real solution for how to make that work. There are no solutions to the problem the movie opened with, of people dying because dinosaurs and humans don't mix. But I guess we can always explore that in future movies. I want to talk about death. That's dark. <laughs> what I mean is character death, or lack thereof. The only deaths I remember seeing are the black market guy getting eaten by the Allosaurus, scooter guy getting eaten by the Allosaurus, one agent gets eaten by an Atrociraptor, a face tat man is finished off by the Baryonyx, and Lewis Dodgson dies to Dilophosaurus. Oh, I nearly forgot one of the best things. Yeah, <laughs> Lewis tries to escape in a Hyperloop pod, but the actions of our heroes in the compound cause the power to fail, so he gets stranded in the tunnel. When he leaves the pod, there is a Dilophosaurus blocking the tunnel, so he scrambles back into the pod, cowering inside, and three Dilos come in. He starts saying some stupid CEO BS like, and what is your story? But he gets caught off by Venom to the face. They spit on him several times and he sinks down to the floor, the Venom of course taking its effect and paralyzing him, and the last shot of the scene is a POV shot as the Dilo attacks him. I think they should have used the POV shot to show him going blind, and then maybe have the screen be black for a while, while we hear him panting, and then eventually he starts screaming and we are grabbing growling and ripping sounds before the scene cuts. That would have been even cooler. But the scene as it is, is poetic justice in its own right and quite spooky. But yeah, only a total of five deaths that I actually remember. More people probably died in like the background, but I didn't catch that. The point is, aside from Dodgson, there was no main character death. I understand the movie not having the boss to do that, because it is a no-win situation, but this route gets them the least hate, I think. But it has to be said, the movie lacks consequences. If they had structured it differently, they could have and should have given Wu his book death. Give him his redemption arc and then still kill him off to evoke a bit of emotion that way. Maybe have him sacrifice himself. Or maybe have Kayla or Ramsey sacrifice themselves. But honestly, and it pains me to say this, 
Maybe Ian should have died in that scene with the Giga. Even though I don't doubt that the franchise will continue, I don't think we will ever see the legacy cast again. And the scene currently plays out kind of silly with the fire-breathing dragon. Ian sacrificing himself the way he nearly died in the first movie would have been, in a sad way, poetic closure. It also would be the ultimate, see? I was right from the start. Bringing back dinosaurs isn't going to end well. I don't know, it's controversial for sure. I don't want this character to die. But what's the point of him living other than giving us the warm and fuzzies, seeing as they're not going to return? My main point is at least one major character, not the villain, should have died. This movie has huge stakes, a world hunger crisis, the death of millions. And in the end, only because the cast in the first and third Jurassic Park was small and isolated, do they have fewer deaths. There is very little death in Jurassic World Dominion. I think that's underwhelming for the epic conclusion of the Jurassic era. Now, I probably sounded predominantly negative throughout this entire discussion, but one of my very few talents is being able to logically criticize something and completely detach that from how much I enjoy something. Because I do enjoy Jurassic World Dominion. It's not the epitome of cinema. When you take off the dino goggles, you see a lot of flaws. But there's just too much good dino stuff in this movie to not be enjoyable to a dinosaur fan like myself. It has too much nostalgia with Alan Grant, Ellie Sadler, and Ian Malcolm to not be enjoyable to an OG Jurassic Park fan like myself. And spotting all of the references is gonna be a fun drinking game when it comes out on DVD. Like top tip from Evo to all my adult viewers. Seriously, do this. It's it's funny. And finally, there are just enough pleasant surprises in this to make it enjoyable. Not any major surprises or plot twists, it plays out very predictably, but little things. Like Claire's character actually being good, and the performances of Bryce Dallas Howard and Isabella Sermon. But also the surprise of the Therizinosaurus being blind, which was a fun little twist, and thankfully something I didn't know before going into the movie. The marketing spoiled that one with a TV spot they released after I had seen it. A lot of people are hating on this movie, and I can't even really blame them. At the end of the day, how much you enjoy a movie is completely subjective. For example, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom has a lot of flaws, and I did end up not liking that movie. So, I don't know. If you hate Jurassic World Dominion, that is a valid opinion to have. If you love Jurassic World Dominion, that is a valid opinion to have. It's all just opinions after all. In a franchise that has been steadily decreasing in quality, I went in with extremely low expectations and I walked out being satisfied with the overall viewing experience, I had fun with this movie, and I'm looking forward to watching it again. There are very few movies that I'll go see in cinema three times. And I even went to go see it alone. That's the first time I went to go see a movie in the cinema alone. That just goes to show how much I wanted to see it again. If you ask me to express that in a number, I'd say 7 or 8 out of 10. Share your own thoughts on Dominion down below. If you've made it through this long video, you are a champ. Thank you. You're a legend and I appreciate you. Thank you so much for watching, liking, subscribing, and until next time, enjoy Dominion. Mm -hmm.